Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Sam Waller Museum webinar series. My name is Connie Wyatt Anderson, and I will be your guest presenter for today's webinar. The Sam Waller Museum webinar series is a short webinar series focusing on some of the museum collections artifacts and our images. And what we're doing, we are using these artifacts and our images to tell a story. So we're using them for an entry point into a local narrative. Before we get any further, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Connie Wyatt Anderson. I am from the Paw, Manitoba. I have been a high school history and geography teacher on the adjacent Apasquiac Cree Nation for the uh, past 20 plus years. My background is also involved in curriculum development. I've worked provincially, nationally, and internationally in curriculum development. And my background, as I said, is teaching history and geography. I live west of the Paw in the Carrot Valley. So today what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a bit of a history on Treaty 5, and we're going to focus on three photographs from the Sam Waller Museum collection. So our focus today, and again, the interesting thing is, is that we are using three images from the Sam Waller Museum collection to tell the story of Treaty 5. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do a bit of an overview of the numbered treaties. That gives us um, some context, some historical context. We're going to look at specifically Treaty Number 5, also known as the Winnipeg Treaty. And then we're going to look at Treaty Number 5 here in Apasquiac Cree Nation and the Paw. To begin with, we're going to set a bit of a um, historical concept, context and look at treaty making in North America. First Nations people engaged in treaty making before Europeans came here, beginning in the 1600s, here being Canada. So the process of making treaties between First Nations groups was an established process. When European newcomers came to North America, and I mean here in the Paul we get um, Bay men coming in, Henry Kelsey, 1690-92, from the Bay, from York Factory coming in, when a variety of fur traders, whether they were voyageurs from Quebec or Baymen came in, really the alliances that they made with the Cree in our area here and other parts of the country were following the protocols, the relationship that they had with fur traders followed the protocols of treaty making that had already existed here. Treaty making continued in other parts of the country I mean, we, we know about treaties, obviously, in the eastern part of Canada, and you can see a little piece on the Royal Proclamation there. After Canada confederated in 1867, the Canadian government, the Crown, embarked on a series of 11 treaties with First Nations peoples, primarily in Western and Northern, what we call today Canada. These treaties began in 1871, in the summer of 1871, August 3rd, 1871, Treaty Number 1, was made at Lower Fort Gary, just north of Winnipeg by Selkirk, Manitoba. After that, you have to think of a map of Manitoba now. Treaty making continued. Treaty number two was made about two weeks later at Manitoba House. Treaty number three, treaty number four, where we live here in the Paw and OCN is treaty number five. Treaty number five again is sequential. It was entered into in 1875 and 1876. And it is the largest treaty area in Manitoba or area and the largest number of First Nations entered this treaty. So where we live here in the Paw and Ocean, we are in treaty number five. To continue on a little bit more about treaty number five, treaty number five was a unique treaty in many ways. It's unique if we compare it, say, to treaty number one. Treaty number one took place at one spot. It took place at Lower Fort Gary. Several First Nations group met treaty commissioners at the fort over the span of about four days. There was all kinds of ceremonies, um, traditional indigenous ceremonies. Treaty commissioners came representing the federal government, the crown. 
So it happened at one spot. So there was one treaty making spot. The uniqueness about treaty number five is that didn't happen actually. Treaty number five happened over two years and it happened at a variety of communities and you can see it on the map. Treaty commissioners left Winnipeg. They left Winnipeg via boat. The first thing you have to do when you're thinking about treaties or uh, history for that matter is erase all the highways in your head. People traveled primarily by water. So the commissioners left Winnipeg, which would have been the governing center of the Northwest Territories at that time. Uh, by 1875, Manitoba was the postage stamp province. They would have gone up the river and then they traveled to various communities and you can see it along the lake. The two primary treaty commissioners of the first treaty trip were um, Alexander Morris, who was the Lieutenant Governor at that time, and James McKay. And they went to, as you can see, if you look, in 1875, Barron's River, Norway House, and Grand Rapids in September. So they visited. The boat they were in was actually a Hudson Bay Company-owned boat. And the places that they visit where they met with the Indigenous peoples in each community were Hudson Bay Company forts. They went back to Winnipeg for the winter and embarked on the second treaty trip the next year. The second treaty trip had different commissioners, Thomas Howard and Jay Lestock Reed, who was a surveyor for the government. They came again on the second trip and they came to OCN in September of 1876. So Treaty 5, interestingly, is also called the Winnipeg Treaty. And I know when I was teaching history, my students were always a bit confused about that. It's called the Winnipeg Treaty because they were traveling via Lake Winnipeg. So you can see the map, you can see the dates, two treaty trips. Um, the First Nations chief, the Cree chief at the time in OCN, Chief John Constant, signed the treaty and four counselors, James Cook, Donald Cook, John Bell, and Peter Bell signed Treaty Number no. 5 for the Pasquayak Creek. The interesting thing, and there are many interesting things about the number of treaties, but sometimes it's the players who, who is negotiating, who is signing, who is representing the Crown and or First Nations peoples. But it's also where they were made. There, is, there are a lot of untold stories about where they're made. I told you that Treaty 1 was signed at Lower Fort Garry. It's a National Historic Site. Treaty number four was actually signed at Fort Ellis, the Manitoba adhesions. The original treaty in September was signed at Fort Coppell. The Manitoba adhesions were made at Fort Ellis and there's nothing left at Fort Ellis. Fort Ellis is close to the community of St. Lazar today, St. Lazar, Manitoba. And there's actually a marker, that's it. It's on private land actually. So there's some interesting things that play. Manitoba House is the same thing. It's not a national historic site. There's nothing there. So there's a lot of untold stories in different places on the ground. If you read about our treaty here in the PAW and um, OCN, the commissioners talk about Devon Mission. Other sources talk about it being made at the Hudson Bay Company Fort. But the Hudson Bay Company, an interesting thing, was in, um, intimately involved in treaty making in the way that they were almost a de facto crown. They provided, I told you, the boat for the treaty commissioners to come up here. And often um, Hudson Bay Company employees in different communities like Norway House um, at Fort Ellis, for example, on treaty number four, acted as local hosts. So let's take a look. I gave you a really, um, high overview of Treaty 5. Here in Opaskwiak and the PAW, we are signatories to Treaty Number 5. So the intent of this webinar series is to highlight some of the very unique collections of the Sam Waller Museum. So what I'm very lucky to have here, and we're gonna take a look at, are three photographs held by the Sam Waller Mu Museum collection that talk about our treaty story here in the PAW and OCN. The first one is a pretty neat one, um, I'll read it to you and you can take a look at it. Second generation of chiefs after the signing of Treaty 5, including Anton Constant in the lower left side. Some, some of the more interesting things about this photo to me are the treaty medals actually. You can see affixed to their suit jackets. 
One interesting thing about the provision of the, the written provisions of the treaties one through five, um, treaty suits were actually one of the provisions. Treaty suits were one of the provisions. Chiefs and headmen, forward slash counselors, were guaranteed a new suit, a new set of clothing every three years by the commissioner. Um, and I'm guessing that's what these are. If you take a look, another interesting thing, and I've seen other museum collections that have actual buttons off the suit in their collections. And quite often the suit buttons, especially in the early years, in the early years, they actually had a, a picture of the crown representing the relationship with the crown. Treaty medals also were started um, to be distributed to chiefs and headmen and counselors by the federal government as a symbol of the honor of the relationship, the brother to brother relationship. And you can see the fellows in the picture wearing treaty medals. You can see treaty medals like this today at the Manitoba Museum. You, you can still see a, see a few of them that are around. There are replicas around too. Treaty medals were interesting. They had the treaty etched on it and they also had the date and on the inverse side, they typically had a picture of Queen Victoria, who was a monarch at the time of these treaty signings. So that's a really, really neat image, a primary source, the history teacher in me wants to call it. I told you we're going to take a look at three images from the Sam Waller collection. This one here is pretty neat too. This is Treaty Day at Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids is, you know, up the waterway from us here in um, Apasquiac in the Paw. And Treaty Day celebrations actually were a very common thing. You can see a Union Jack flag flying there. Um, this is typical of treaty making and treaty celebration symbols and symbolism. The suits, the medals, the Union Jack are, are very common. What happened after is that after the treaties were entered into 1875 and 76 here in Treaty 5, it was common for people to get together annually on the site that the treaty took place, where treaty payments were now made and people would visit and, and, and um, re-honor re the brother-to-brother -brother relationship. Today we have modern day treaty celebrations. I told you that we were going to look at three images today that, that spoke to our treaty history here in Ocean in the Paw. This last image is from a Hudson Bay Company store here in the Paw, um, which is kind of neat too. It says it's before the 1920s. So remember, um, that we're in traditional Pasquayac territory here in the Paw and Ocean. They entered the treaty in 1875, 1876. And I told you the reason I thought this was an interesting one, even though it doesn't have a treaty medal or the word treaty in it, is that the place of the bay, the Hudson's Bay Company was very important as a treaty landscape. I use the word a de facto government. The bay just had their 350th anniversary this year, 2020. That's why I kind of wanted to include that one. So the neat thing is, when you tell the story of the past, whether it's national, provincial, or local history, like Sam Waller Museum here in the Paw, we rely on sources. We rely on primary sources, like journals and diaries and the three photographs that I just told you. We rely on artifacts. We rely on secondary sources, like books. And we rely on oral testimony, the stories. So if we piece this all together, we can tell our own local story. So the story we told today, using some wonderful pieces from the Sam Waller collection, is the story of Treaty 5. My name's Connie. I want to thank you again for joining me today. And I want to encourage you to visit the Sam Waller Museum here in the Paw, Manitoba.